Day 407 of the Ukrainian War Map, also known as the Russo-Ukrainian War. Juzzy here, and today is a, another update as I take a simplified and down to approach to some of the most important happenings on the ground in Ukraine. So we'll start out with taking a quick look at the Russian losses there today, and currently Russia is sitting on 176,630 military personnel losses there. Then when we take a look at the hardware, two tanks, eight APVs, seven artillery, and one Russian air defense system. And you may have noticed, uh, I do love to emphasize any Russian air defense system loss because, well, as a famous World War I French general uh, said once there, whoever controls the air controls the battlefield. And although taking out all of an enemy's air defences is not the sole determinant for victory in a conflict, well, it sure does help. Then we'll move back across to the map. And another one of Russia's, uh, well, the Russian Ministry of Defence buildings in the capital of Moscow has engaged itself with a, a fiery ordeal. Although, Russian state media reported that the fire in the building started because of a kettle. And I just love me a good Russian excuse at this point. Then, also in Russia's second largest city of uh, St. Petersburg, right up here, close by to Finland, something was cooking downtown there as well, although no funny excuses were given. Uh, in fact, no excuses at all. Then moving down on the map, still in Russia today, my personal favourite for the day. So someone took a photo of these cope cones. Uh, now this was in the Belgorod Oblast in here. Now basically it just has an unwelcoming message for Ukraine. But more than that, check out the degradation of these cones. Cracking away after exposure to the elements. Just awful. Then we'll move back onto the Ukrainian map and we'll move across down to the Donbass in Bakhmut, where, as Zelensky himself has just referred to it as a, uh, for the situation, remaining complicated, he said, and subject to change every day. And in fact, you'll notice with the map, it never turned out to be an encirclement or entrapment by the Russian forces. But instead, they've been pushing out small gains from the east day by day now. And as such, Ukrainian forces hold the, the western city blocks for the most part there now. And currently the two train stations in the city. Although the train station just to the north of the city is likely uh, well, looking to be pretty dicey of a situation right now being that it's so close to the to the front uh, lines or the contact point there. Then, just south of those very front lines in Klishchivka, right down here, there was quite the spectacular explosion. As Ukrainian drone footage, well, it picked up a, a Russian S-29 self-propelled mortar, then uh, relayed those coordinates back to the Ukrainian artillery to make some pretty fast work out of that one. Then, somewhere in the east, Ukrainian forces took out yet another Ka-52 alligator, which is the most common variant taken out. Roughly 40 plus uh, confirmed hits or, or taken out of these types of aircraft in well, during the war and just as a note the the code name the nato code name for these aircraft are hokum and reason for that uh, well long story short is uh way back when they were considered to be more of a paper tiger than anything and uh it turns out in reality that may be true as well pretty consistent with what we're seeing these days then, also in the region, Ukrainian forces located and took out a portable Russian surveillance radar with indirect fire. Now, these radar devices are designed to be highly mobile and often used in conjunction with other military equipment such as artillery and um, certainly air defense systems as well. But not this one, not anymore. Then we'll move right across to the Kherson Oblast 
as a Russian giant sent uh, B 152 millimeter Soviet field gun was destroyed by an M982 Excalibur precision artillery strike on the left bank of the Dnipro. But also nearby, Ukrainian artillery hit and destroyed a base of uh, Russian forces in Karashinka across the Dnipro there as well. So a busy day all in all for Kherson. Then we'll move down just very briefly today to the occupied Crimean Peninsula where a, uh, so the video is of a, a Russian surveillance station hit with a Ukrainian kamikaze drone. Unfortunately, it would be quite untoward to show the footage, but uh, three guesses as to what happened after that. Kaboom. Then we'll move across to some news for today. So starting off, Russia's top diplomat and foreign minister, Lavrov, is continuing to say some remarkable things. So this time he's announced that Russia and the US are in the hot phase of the war, which suggests these two countries are in a direct engagement or military combat, as opposed to, say, a Cold War, for instance, which is more of an indirect proxy war. And all I can really think to say about this is, if Russia thinks they're in the hot phase of a war with the US, well, then that is one tame hot war right there. Then in some similar news with uh, Russia looking to outdo itself with some of that sweet, sweet Russian logic, just a few hours ago, Russia all of a sudden remembered international law and stated that Ukraine had sabotaged uh, Russia's satellite communications, calling it an outrageous violation of international law. Really, Russia? Really? I mean, imagine for a moment, you are a country that invades another country, you destroy the lands and its people using military force, and even shell the occasional hospital, and then when that didn't work out as planned, you tried to freeze the population by destroying critical power infrastructure right before winter, and then when that didn't work out, and the, the enemy has finally geared up to target your own infrastructure, at that very moment, you scream they broke international law. Just imagine the absolute absurdity of that thought process. But I'm not pointing any fingers here. Then in some other news, Chinese ambassador to the EU, so Mr. Fu, said some pretty remarkable statements yesterday, uh, expressing that China's uh, professed no-limits relationship with Russia is nothing but rhetoric, political rhetoric, and meaningless. He also went on to say that Russia does not recognize, uh, uh, sorry, China does not recognize Russia's annexation of Crimea or other territories. But these are simply words with no real uh, backing to them. In other words, China is simply playing both sides, and they've, and they've done it before. For instance, I'm reminded of a few times at least where China hasn't uh, stuck to its uh, political or foreign commitments, such as when they promised to spend an additional 200 billion US dollars in trade purchases with the United States as part of a phase one uh, trade deal with the US. That never materialized and that was meant to happen in 2020, 2021. Then there's also the time when China said it would respect international law and not build up militarily in the South China Sea. Another broken promise. Well, what else do we have? So perhaps uh, the Hong Kong. Okay, so the, the Sino-British uh, declaration that they uh, China broke and moved in, removing Hong Kong's autonomy uh, about 20, 25 years too early. There is also the, uh, the forced, uh, all the Chinese uh, IP rights issues or intellectual property theft. Uh, they promised not to perform IP theft and, and forced, uh, instead for, had some forced technological transfers, etc. This is all the, off the top of my head. I've probably got seven or eight more examples. But the point here is that uh, well, the international community should be looking at China with a very, very close eye and not just trusting them or anyone on face value. And this all comes at a time when French President Macron has just visited China's Xi Jinping to get China to pressure Moscow to de-escalate, but also in the process not provide Russia with any uh, military arms as well. So we'll see how that goes. 
Then in a potentially another Russian military mobilization blunder, so there is some signs of a hidden mobilization happening in the Moscow capital at the moment, right now, as the Russian government is suddenly having a huge influx of volunteers. And I've joked about this plenty before, and I've also hypothesized about situations like this, where Russia has milked out so much of what it can from the poorer eastern oblasts, and so they're strong-arming civilians in the cities now to coerce them into volunteering to go to war. Because Putin is realizing that a public announcement of an additional mobilization on top of the previous one, and technically on top of the previous one before that, when they had the announcement of the quote-unquote SMO, or Special Military Operation, he realizes that he's very likely to lose support locally for this war that he single-handedly decided to start. And so the common joke I refer to here is instead of him announcing it, he just instead goes along and does it. You really do want to be a good law-abiding citizen in the capitals of Russia right now, particularly the two biggest ones, St. Petersburg and Moscow. Then in a quick funny to rat it all off for today, guys, so Russia's car industry, and most likely industry in general for Russia, has collapsed by 67%. But not all is bad. Ammunition production rose by an impressive 7% compared to peace times. And this is all according to the University of Moscow, so, so no Western numbers here. But if Russia and Putin himself thinks he can ramp up industrial military capacity to levels from that of the Soviet Union back in those days... He is just dreaming, and the economics are simply not there for Russia to do that. And to top it off, he's just helping to destroy and annihilate his regular economy's local industry in the process instead. So thanks for watching, guys. Please leave a comment, subscribe, hit that like button. appreciate all of the support, and I do hope to see all of you guys there in the next one. Cheers.